to the July webinar uh, hosted by TVC. Uh, my name is Nick Hillish. I'm, I'm the Chief Sales Officer here at TVC ProDriver, and I am uh, joined by, uh, by Doug Marcello. So Doug is the Chief Legal Officer at Blue Wire. Uh, a little bit about Doug. So Doug's been a defense attorney for close to 40 years now, and uh, specifically the last 20 has been spent uh, representing uh, as a defense attorney for uh, for trucking companies across the country. So uh, Doug, you know, happy to have you here on uh, on the call with us. Do, do you mind uh, just taking a moment to introduce yourself before we get started? Not, not at all, Nick. And it's great to be here. <clears throat> I've been, uh, as Nick uh, kindly pointed out, a defense attorney for ages here, uh, the last 20 for trucking. I have my CDL. I've had cases where I've been admitted in 35 states, especially for the cases. Uh, in addition to that, as Nick had indicated, I'm chief legal officer for Blue Wire, been involved in a number of trucking organizations, including the Pennsylvania Motor Truck Board of Directors. So thanks, Nick. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, so just to recap what we're really going to cover today. So we're really going to talk about, you know, what we're seeing from a trending perspective as far as accidents and, and lawsuits, uh, da the dangers of, of delayed defense, the uh, the value preparing now for the, in in the inevitable, right? I mean, we all know, I mean, you drive a truck long enough, you know, things happen. Um, and then uh, really how to protect yourself from uh, from frivolous lawsuits. I, I don't think the environment's getting any easier out there. And uh, we're seeing more and more of these frivolous lawsuits popping up. So, you know, what can we do there to, to really help uh, reduce our risk? Uh, but then overall, how to reduce our total cost of risk. Uh, so with that, Doug, you know, I, I guess, you know, I would just love to keep this conversational. For the folks on the, on the phone um, listening in. So, I mean, feel free to type in questions as we go along. So we can answer questions as we go along, but we'll save a few minutes at the end here to uh, to do some Q and A as well. So with that, Doug, I'll pass it over to you. Perfect. Well, I think one of the big things is that the reality of our industry is number one, accidents are going to happen regardless of who fault they are, and the second thing is suits are going to arise from accidents regardless of whose fault they are. <clears throat> That's the reality, uh, and we've got to be prepared for it. And the time to prepare is now because what you do before the accident is evidence. What you do afterwards. That's looked at as backfill by those who sue us in these cases. So what we need to do is to be prepared to respond and take away the issues that they try to leverage for a nuclear verdict in these cases. Rarely, if ever, is a nuclear verdict a function of the accident itself or the driver. It's more an attack and it's virtually always an attack on your company and allegations of a systemic failure. So that's the kind of thing that we need to do, look at ahead of time and try to address before it comes on. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it really makes total sense. And I mean, it's, uh, you know, so Doug and I are actually here at the ATA Legal Forum in Austin, Texas. And, you know, so hearing a number of different stories, you know, one of the unique things that we got to, you know, sit down yesterday is really hearing both sides of the, of the story. So we heard from the defense side, we heard from the plaintiff side, and it was really quite fascinating to me to understand the different perspectives. And, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of the things that go into it. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think, you know, as we get into the conversation, Doug, it'd be helpful, you know, I mean, so as we talk about, you know, what people can do to, you know, just better prep for, for those types of events. So again, you know, like really preparing for the inevitable. So, I mean, your opinion yesterday, you know, I mean, as we, as we listened to that session, I mean, what were some of the things that really stuck out to you? I think one of the big things the plaintiff attorneys are talking about and looking at is trying to exploit weaknesses, vulnerabilities that we have. So what you do ahead of time in order to <clears throat> look for them, self-audit, self-analyze, try to find those ahead of time to take away their, uh, their arguments for them. There's a group of attorneys out there that are focused on primarily, if not exclusively, suing trucking companies. They're giving courses out there how to use and manipulate your data. Uh, one of their courses is called uh, Trucks, a Treasure Trove of Data, you know, appropriately enough. It, it, what we need to do is to get ahead of that. Look at what data you have, identify it. Look at what is the key indicators. What are the key indicators in terms of accidents, driver behavior? Monitor that specific behavior and then discipline on it as you go ahead. And, and you know, one of the things, Nick, and, and I think, you know, is key for TBC is, you know, these claims that are coming out of systemic failures, a lot of times it focuses not so much on what the driver did, but on their background. And that's why it's necessary to make sure that you and your drivers are aware of and protect that record so that while there may be violations, citations that are of no fault, uh, you know, 
too often it's kind of sloughed off of, well, it's just a ticket or this, that, that all accumulates to a series. And that was one of the things in the, uh, that we saw yesterday was uh, on small accidents in that case. But the same thing happens with tickets, where if we don't address these and knock these out as we go along, it gives the misimpression, it just seems to snowball in these cases. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a fantastic point. That really stuck out to me yesterday too, Doug, is, I mean, they pulled up accidents over the course. I mean, the driver had been driving for, what, 30 years? And they went back as far as they could and they pulled every single little fender bender. And it was never, you know, a, a serious accident. And then, but they used that against them as much as they could. And yeah. uh, so, I mean, to your point, it's like, I mean, what can we do to reduce that that exposure to that level of risk? And I think you know, it's, it's one, it's being aware, but then, you know, doing something about that. So, you know, I mean, having data for the sake of having data doesn't really do anybody any good. And sometimes, and I'd love to get your opinion on this, Doug, but I, you know, I think sometimes having too much data can actually get yourselves in trouble if you're not doing anything with that data. But then again, on, on the other side of the equation, you have like everybody knows the data is available. So, I mean, these these you know plaintiff attorneys, they're going to paint the picture like, hey, have you been living under a rock for the past yeah. you know, 10 years? I mean, you know, this is available. Why aren't you doing some of these things as an organization? So I'd love to get your perspective you know, on both sides of that equation. There is a paralysis by paranoia too often in our industry, and it is what I call the discovery fallacy. The notion is that, gee, you know, if I go out and do something with it, if I look at this data, if I analyze it, you know, that's going to be discoverable and it might not look good. Well, here's the deal. Like I just said, the plaintiff attorneys are out there giving courses on getting that data as it is. So you're either going to get ahead of it, manage that data and do something about it, or are you going to abdicate the entire management of that to the plaintiff attorneys to come up with whatever story, whatever picture they want to paint, as misshapen as that may be? Yeah, it's really, really unfortunate. But I mean, it's it's the reality of the world that we live in. And, you know, and I know, I mean, you're doing a, a ton of stuff. I mean, you're a huge advocate from, you know, the defense side. And I mean, you mentioned, I mean, there's books, there's courses, there's all sorts of things out there from the plaintiff side just to specifically attack trucking companies. And do you mind talking about, Doug, like some of the things, you know, that the defense side is really starting to engage in? I mean, that's one of the beautiful things, I think, with the AT Legal Forum is, I mean, everybody's kind of getting together and saying, hey, you know, what can we do to rally together and work together in some of these things to point out and reduce that overall risk? So I don't know if you mind talking about you know, sure. some of those things, Doug. Yeah, what, what, what we really need to do, again, you know, number one, before the accident, uh, look at what I call the defensible driver. You know, what does that driver's record look like? And if need be, what can you do to, through courses or classes or otherwise, to make that record defensible? You know, when the accident happens, be prepared and respond immediately. You know, because what happens in that immediate time frame is crucial to the case. We, we lament the fact of those billboards we drive by every time, whether it's on the 15 going into Las Vegas, the 10 in Louisiana, wherever it is, all over the country. Yet we have an advantage that none of those attorneys have, the advantage of immediacy. No one knows about that accident before you do. So if you're not prepared, respond and react right away. You will have squandered your greatest of assets. And then when that accident happens, too often I see folks sitting back and figuring, well, and I think the thing yesterday, Nick, was, well, we don't have a claim yet. They made a reference on the thing. You know, look, there's an accident. There's somebody out there. Get ahead of it. You know, one of the things that I do in my practice is uh, as soon as we get a letter from another attorney saying they represent the driver, what I do is fire one back, say, I represent the trucking company. And by the way, here's releases for your medical and employment records. We want those right away. And I also want to have your client examined by a doctor. Now, a lot of times they'll come back and go, well, gee, what right do you have to do that? I go, well, I got no legal right at this point. But here's the deal. I've gone on record to say that we want to have them examined. Now, if you refuse, sometime later on, a year or two, when you go to trial, you're going to have to explain why, if your person was legitimately injured, you, you wouldn't submit them to an examination. So those are the things we need to do to get out there and after it. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, what I'm hearing from you, Doug, I mean, it's really about taking proactive measures. Exactly. And I mean, I think there's a number of things that, you know, we can do as, a, as an industry, um, you know, to help fight against some of this stuff. But I mean, really, you know, just, I mean, what you mentioned, just being proactive about it. We all know, like, you know, 
hey, they're going to ask for these things so we can get out in front and uh, and try to control it. I mean, that's what I really picked up on yesterday. It was all about, you know, who is controlling the game and ultimately who is in control was, you know, I mean, they both wanted a positive outcome for both of their clients. I mean, it was really a, a unique case that they talked about and I, I really respected, you know, both sides. But, you know, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it came down to like, you know, who is controlling the narrative. And uh, so I think to your point, getting out in front and, uh, and, you know, understanding some of those things and working together, um, you know, to come to the, the best resolution. So what are, what are some other things, Doug? I mean, as you look at it, you know, like, I mean, so if we look at how we can reduce our overall risk before the accident even occurs, right? So, I mean, and this is really where we get into the inevitable part. You know, what, what are some things that, you know, that fleets can, or motor carriers can take, uh, you know, just take control of up front uh, to really help reduce that overall exposure? Yeah, one of the things, you, if you've been in or around the industry for the last uh, 13 years, you will have heard about the reptile theory. And the reptile theory, in short, is a strategy by the plaintiffs to prey upon the human element of fear for safety of not just themselves, but their entire community. And they try to make the case about one where it is imperative that the jury do something about this otherwise there is a threat to safety for the community, thus a big verdict. That's it in a nutshell. Well, when you go back to the book, we learn that the book, The Reptile Theory, tells plaintiff attorneys when it's not going to work. You know, number one, if your claim's not legitimate. So if we can proactively show there's no legitimate basis for their lawsuit. Number two, you know, it doesn't work if it's just an accident. If there's no systemic failure there, no internal problems again. So if we can show that it's just an accident, there's nothing else to do here. We've been proactive in addressing the systemic issues. That'll take it away. And the third thing is there's nothing, as they say in the book, to ameliorate in layman's terms to change or to correct. So if we can say, look, you know, we have been on this. We recognize what our vulnerabilities are. We are addressing them if we haven't addressed them to this point. Here's what the data shows and here's what we can do. And do that all ahead of time. And it just takes, and defeats the whole notion of the reptile theory. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, a great, great, all great points, Doug. Um, the, uh, you know, as we look at, yeah, I mean, last year at the ATA Legal Forum, I think, you know, we had a session on staged accidents. And I mean, we're starting to see that more and more across the country as well. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's really, I mean, just unbelievable, you know, what goes into this and how organized, you know, that, you know, crime, because that's what it is, how organized that crime, uh, you know, is taking place. And, you know, so, I mean, what, you know, I think it's important for the folks to hear on the call, like, what are, what are some of those things that they can help mitigate, you know, the risk and exposure, you know, to that type of event taking place? And what are the things that, you know, that we're doing as an industry um, and, uh, you know, to help, you know, reduce that overall exposure? Sure. Yeah, cool. kudos to uh, Randy Gilliatt down in New Orleans, uh, who has a trucking company down there, saw this, understood what the, uh, the heights he's going to have to climb to fight it, but still fought the fight and brought this. And I was just looking earlier today, I think as of April, 33 people have been indicted for this type of behavior. And, and so one of the key things there, it goes back to cameras. You know, having the cameras, digital data to show what's happening and doing the investigation. And it's also committing to saying, you know, you know, like Randy did, you know, this is wrong. You know, I'm going to do something about it. And that's what brought it proactively to Randy videos from other units from, uh, you know, from other cameras around the area. And that video evidence put it all together and synced it up to, in order to reveal this entire process. Yeah, and I mean, it's a great point on 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 cameras. And, you know, I go back to, you know, how we talked about, you know, if, I mean, it's a, it's really a double edged sword, right? So, I mean, you'll have, you know, some some fleets are electing not to go with cameras, but in the event of an accident taking place, I mean, one, they can, you know, they can really prove out exactly what occurred. And I mean, if you were at fault, then you understand like, hey, like we can settle, uh, you know, this quickly versus, you yeah. know, going to, a, a, you know, a jury trial, right? right? So, I mean, I think we can avoid a lot of, you know, conflict and, you know, heartache, you know, is, is it, you know, by leveraging those cameras, even when we're at fault. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, in the, and then, you know, on the other side of the equation, it's like, okay, so one, they can help us, but, you know, I think, you know, fleet said, you know, that aren't going forward with cameras, 
um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, that plaintiff attorney, they can paint that picture. Like, again, like, have you been living under a rock for the past 10 years? I mean, did you not know that this was available to you? You know, why are you not using these types of things when you know it's readily available? Um, you know, so I, I mean, what, I would love to get your take on that, Doug. You know, when when cameras were first introduced to trucking about 15 years ago, my reaction, Nick, was, you know, geez, you know, just what I need, one more piece of evidence to have a proctologist get back. You know, and it's like, come on. But, but then as we go along, the more I thought about it, it's like, well, you know, we get blamed for everything anyhow. So we might as well at least have the video of the exonerations to show that we weren't at fault in these cases. And I've had it, in, and again, I don't know of any studies, but anecdotally, most companies tell me that four out of the five of the videos help them. In that fifth video, well, look, we know what the problem is. Let's get on it and get it done and get out of there on the whole thing. And it's not just the videos that deal with the accidents. I had a driver a number of years ago where he was charged with leaving the scene of an accident. It's a very serious offense. And the basis of the charge was another truck driver who said, you know, I'm a trucker. I know the, I, I, that was exactly the guy who did it and left the scene. Fortunately, he had running video that showed him coming up and going through the scene after the accident happened. Without that video, you know, he'd have been out of, uh, out of work and off the road for six months, a year, whatever on that. So the cameras are just invaluable. And then ultimately, the other two things are number one for training purposes in order to try to uh, address the behavior ahead of time proactively, like we said, you know, hey, you know, the best defense is no accident. And then the last part is to use that video to flip it around and to sue those and be proactive, do it ahead of time. I had one where the video showed we weren't at fault. There were two uh, four wheelers at fault. We sued one on that and we kept them, even though they had attorneys for bodily injury cases, we kept them from even bringing suit because that was game, set, match. Event. So, you know, it, 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 the tools are there and we are limited only by our inability to look at how we can use them, what we can do. And to the extent that people succumb to the paranoia of paralysis, the, 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 they, are, they, they look at fear as being a 1% issue as opposed to what is the analysis and what is the risk that we have versus the benefit. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, it, the, the technology is incredible, you know, when, when you use it. Um, so, I mean, you know, we've really hit on a lot of the things that can help, you know, people reduce that exposure to you know, frivolous type lawsuits. And, you know, I think, I mean, everybody, um, and I shouldn't say everybody, but most would agree that cameras can be extremely helpful in, uh, in avoiding some of those frivolous lawsuits. Are there other, you know, I mean, you've been around a long time, Doug, and, you know, and, you know, been representing fleets across the country, but are there other things that you've seen organizations do and implement to really, you know, help avoid some of those frivolous lawsuits and just reduce that overall exposure to that risk? Yeah, you know, uh, th there is a time, and again, go back to my good friend, Randy Gilliatt, calls it the dark period, where the accident happens and nobody does anything until there's a lawsuit. And that's a, that's a death trap. Uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen, come to the Bryce Jordan Center March 18th, Nick, got to be there, baby. So what happens on this is, you know, we, we got to get out there. Like I said, I push back, I tell them we want their, you know, an examination, we want their records. But you know, use that time period. If we suspect that these folks are going to go for the gusto, then th we'll have surveillance on them early on, and get that. And I've had that where you know the attorney comes in and look, the plaintiff attorney, they're looking at ROI. They don't want to waste their time and money on a case. And we go, yeah, well, here's your guy lifting a TV last week, something like that. One of the other things is and we heard about this a little yesterday was in terms of the judicial hellhole, getting sued in venues that are just terrible for trucking companies. Well, in many jurisdictions, and what we do in Pennsylvania, we have a rule that wherever the first suit is filed, that's the court that decides where the case is gonna be venued. And 90% of the time, it's gonna stay in that court. So what'll happen is if I have a case, I have an accident, and we have an argument in terms of who's at fault, and we've suffered damage, <clears throat> we'll sue the other folks first. And then that way, we'll keep it out of the judicial hellholes, one of which we have in Pennsylvania, uh, and keep it in a more defense-friendly venue to the extent that exists now. Got it. And I mean, and again, it goes back to proactive measures, right? And controlling exactly. that narrative. So, I mean, if you're getting out in front of some of these things, yeah. I mean, you can set yourself up for a better chance of success by doing that versus 
delaying, right? And that was one of yeah. the points of the webinar is, yeah. you know, I mean, we don't want to delay that defense, right? No. So, um, you know, I mean, so I think that's a fantastic point on, you know, some of the proactive measures people can take and just, you know, not delaying and, you know, let's get out in front of this as, as quickly as we can. Um, you know, from, so at, at the point an accident occurs, Doug, and, and I know you've, you know, defended a lot of accident cases from a best practice standpoint. I mean, what are some things that fleets are doing, like, a, you know, immediately once that accident occurs, um, you know, documentation or, you know, or whatever they're doing to, you know, to stay out in front of some of this stuff. So I don't know if you have any best practices that you can share Absolutely. in that regard. You know, number Number one, make sure that you preserve what you have, because there's a concept called spoliation. It sounds like spoliation, that's fine. It gets the point across. But basically, the gist of it is, if there's evidence that you have and you know would be important or should know be important to a case, if you don't have that at the time of the case, then the judge is going to give an instruction, usually, that that evidence must have been bad for you. Uh, so number one, make sure you lock it down, particularly with telematics. Because a lot of that goes away in 30 days, 60 days. Make sure you get that locked down. Preserve the video. Do an ECM download. In today's world, uh, many plaintiff's attorneys can't spell ECM, but they know from their classes and what they learn online that they want to have one and get it. They don't know what it is. Make sure you do that whenever possible. Even if, it, even if it's uh, probably not relevant to the accident, to take the time and invest a small amount of money takes their beef away from them that you should have done that. Consider, uh, number one, making sure your drivers are trained in order to taking videos. Capture the videos of the damage or lack of damage is even just as important because that gives us a foundation for a biomechanical expert who can look at that and go, wait a minute, there's not enough force there for a cervical herniation or something along those lines. Uh, one of the other things is, uh, and this is usually the most heretical thing I say, is don't take statements from your driver. Because, you know, all that's going to do is be discoverable and be used against you at the time. What many companies, what they'll do is they'll have me or others who are attorneys talk to their drivers, get the information, protect it with attorney-client privilege. And then we have, we know what it is, we can go forward with the investigation, but it's not in a format that's going to be readily discoverable. So those are kind of along the lines, Nick, in terms of general, what you need to do to be able to go and move immediately right after the accident happens. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to the point of, you know, preparing for the inevitable. And it's not just, you know, preparing your organization, um, you know, and some of the back office processes, but it's also preparing your driver. And, you know, because if that, you know, driver is involved in the accident, I mean, that driver needs to understand, like, hey, here, here's what I should and should not do, um, you know, to, to have the best possible outcome for the organization. So, you know, I think it's, you know, just that continued education. Um, you know, with your drivers as well, you know, from a resource standpoint, Doug, you know, as we look at, you know, training for drivers, I mean, what are some things that you've seen fleets do to, you know, from a best practice standpoint, on, you know, making sure their drivers are equipped with the proper education and knowledge and tools, um, you know, to best avoid, you know, a difficult situation? You know, the key thing, Nick, is I think, think in terms of, you know, if, if, within your company, how you read and absorb or how you get your information and, and how your drivers of their generation can get their information. You know, the standard is to have a, uh, you know, a manual about this thick, give it out at orientation, have the driver sign that it received it. Then I sit through a deposition two or three years later, driver, did you get the manual? Yeah. Did you sign for it? Yeah. To read it? Well, you know, you know, uh, you know I don't know how many safety directors have read their manual. You know, the other thing is they feel that they need to put a lot of safety platitudes in there that people don't live up to, you know, because what's going to happen is that manual is going to be the standard of care that your driver is going to be held against. So to get back to your question, you know, number one, I don't know that necessarily needs to be in a manual. Think in terms of conveying the information, short videos, TikTok, you know, I, I don't do my dances anymore since that unfortunate flossing injury, but you know, short videos are getting information across to people. And I think that's how people are learning. You know, short bullet points. Uh, you know, I've talked to people that have used uh, PowerPoint slides and found that to be the best way to do it. Uh, near me, Hershey Medical Center, they are doing non-surgical cases. They're using graphic novel techniques, almost like cartoons, because it gets in there and gets it visualized. The key thing is, Whatever you do, the idea is not to have something that you're trying to impress somebody with. It's to convey the information. And that's how it goes. Yeah, and, and great point. I mean, I think, 
yeah, I mean, to that extent, I mean, it's really about keeping it simple too. I mean, let's not overcomplicate things because sometimes I think if you overcomplicate things, now you're holding your organization to even higher standard and that plaintiff attorney can come in there and just paint the picture how he wants. It's like, okay, yeah, you're holding yourself to high standard, but, but yeah. what are you doing? You know, I mean, yeah. are, are you actually executing to that standard? And if you're not, I mean, then you're opening well, yourself up for, exactly. for, for failure. So yeah, um, yeah that's, uh, I mean, all great points. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, you know, here, Doug, but, uh, you know, really, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the cool things that Blue Wire as an organization is doing. And we're really excited. So, you know, for the folks on the, on the phone, uh, the folks that are going to listen to the recording, we actually just, uh, we, we just signed a partnership agreement with Blue Wire. Exciting. Um, and it's really in alignment with some of the things that we're, that, you know, that we're ultimately trying to drive, you know, from a safety standpoint. Uh, but, you know, really the ultimate goal for all of us is, is you know, reducing that exposure, reduce the risk, and, uh, and ultimately reduce accidents on the road to keep our road, roadway safer, right? I mean, that's what we all want in this industry. Um, you know, so would love to hear, you know, just, you know, high level, Doug, you know, some of the really unique things that Blue Wire as an organization is doing with some of that data and how you can help drive some of those decisions for, for motor carriers. Appreciate it, Nick, and, and excited and thrilled to have you guys uh, as be part of our network, part of our allies. So we greatly appreciate it. Yeah, what we're looking to do is to use data and the resources to develop a strategic defense that's proactive before the accident. We do that by looking at about 250 data points. Look at those in terms of what are the vulnerabilities that you have that could be exploited by a plaintiff's attorney. Then we refer organizations such as TVC or others to help you to fill those voids, to address those vulnerabilities. You know, in the absence since the FAST Act in 2015, when Congress told the FMCSA to develop a beyond compliance program, yeah, how's that going? We, we have created our own so that you can get recognized for your investment in and your commitment to safety and also total up all of the money that you spend to take away that argument that it's somehow binary, profits versus safety. No, you're doing both to recognize that. And then generate a number of bullet points to have so that you can then create your own narrative to show how long it's been since you've been in a basic what you've done in terms of this, add to it your civic responsibilities that you've done. And that was one of the things we talked about yesterday, Nick, at the, at the program. You know, show what your true company is. You know, you're just not a collection of vehicles and drivers who go out on the road. You know, you, you are a community entity doing well, who are bringing what an America needs as its lifeblood. And that's what we're trying to convey in there. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, to your point, cult, culture. I mean, that's a huge yeah. thing within an organization. And it's not, you know, we're not the big bad trucking company out there driving, yeah. you know, crazy and causing accidents, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think doing some of these proactive things and, you know, partnering with companies like Blue Wire, you know, it ultimately mm -hmm. allows you to make, you know, better decisions, number one, Absolutely. right? Because now you have, you know, some of that data and you're, and you're seeing where some of your gaps might be. And hey, here's how we can address some of those gaps as an organization to really become a best of breed, uh, you know, company. And, and represent the the industry well. Um, so I mean, it's really exciting to see some of that stuff and what you guys are doing, Doug. And you know, we're 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 really excited about the partnership as well because again, it's it's right in line with you know with some of the initiatives that uh, we at TBC Pro Driver have as well. Absolutely. So, um, well, with that, we've got a couple of minutes, folks. So would love to hear from you if you have you know questions. I uh, want to save this last two minutes for uh, for questions and answers. Um, so feel free to type in in the chat, and uh, and we'll do our best to uh, to answer those questions. Uh, but you know, if not, uh, you know, we will be sending out the uh, the webinar. Uh, the recording. So, I mean, you, know, you guys can you know, feel free to go back to this. Uh, but if you do have additional questions or if you want to learn more about Blue Wire and some of the things that Blue Wire is doing, you can feel free to reach out to, uh, to, to myself. Um, Carol put uh, my information in the, uh, in the chat or you can reach out directly to Doug as well. So if, uh, Carol will be sharing that information in the chat and we'll also send that out uh, as part of a recap. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, with that, let's see if we have any questions that have come in. Does not appear that we have yet, but we'll, we'll keep the line open here for two minutes. I mean, I mean any any parting words for, uh, for you know for the, for the group here, Doug, before uh, before we head out? Yeah, absolutely. Get ahead of it. You know, the key thing is to look at what you're going to do and, and develop that protection. You know, the example I use is that uh, think about it. You're a football coach. You know, you, you have your team has the ball on the other team's three yard line. 
you know, that you need a touchdown to win. That's not the time you're going to start to design your play, figure out who's going to run the play and try to find them on the bench. You know, now's the time to develop that play to defend against the accidents you have so that you can go back and do that at the time when it occurs. Excellent stuff. Hey, so we did have one question here and probably have time for, you know, maybe one more, but, uh, but Shedrick Brown, she uh, was asking if an accident occurs, what's the things not to say or do immediately, Doug? You know, I, I uh, about every Saturday morning, I go out and uh, talk to different trucking companies. And Cedric, the biggest advice I give to people is to be quiet. You know, the, inf the information to give is uh, your driver's license, your insurance information, registration, and the briefest version of the accident. What happened? I came over the hill, couldn't stop, made contact. Boom, that's it. You know, other than that, there, there's nothing you're going to say to be able to to be able to get uh, helpful or to try to help you along those lines. You know, so I think that's the key situation there. Brevity, silence never hurts. So don't say too much. No. That makes sense. Well, looks like, uh, okay. Uh, so Shedrick is also asking, if I have a dash cam video, do I offer that to the officer immediately? That's a great question. Yeah. And I, I would hesitate to offer it immediately, uh, to put it out there. Number one, if they ask for it, uh, you know, I usually err on the side of cooperation. The worst case scenario, they're going to get a, uh, a warrant to get it anyhow. And yeah, you know, you made them just jump through some hoops. But if it exonerates you, uh, if it's one that's favorable, you know, put it out there. I would share it right away. You know, make it available to them and show them, particularly before they write up the report. Uh, that way you will have controlled your narrative by what you have in terms of the video. Excellent. Well, folks, really appreciate everybody joining. Doug, special thanks to you for, uh, you know, for joining Thank you the, very much. The, the July webinar. Really enjoyed the conversation. And, uh, you know, and, you know, again, super excited about our partnership and, and you know, what you guys are doing in the industry. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to be really, really fun to watch, you. you know, all the advancements that you guys are making and, uh, you know, ultimately driving, driving safer roads. So, um, yeah. but, uh, cool. but with that, you know, again, I mean, any questions at all, feel free to reach out directly and we will be sending out the, uh, the, the copy of the reporting here as well. So with that, everybody, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you.